Hey, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Hello. and said, you know, I, I can call and ask to talk to the mayor.
But I know Sneaky, you had mentioned leaving some time for questions. Do we want to? Are we ready for questions? Are we getting started?
Hey, are, are we going to get started? Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. All right. Some technical difficulties, but I think we're all set up. Um, good. Good evening, honorable members of council, chief of staff Washington, chief of staff Walker department heads, and members of the public. This evening, there are two budget hearings scheduled. The license of licenses and inspections department at 4.30 p.m., followed by real estate and housing at 6.30 p.m. I would like to start by recognizing members of the finance committee who have joined us this evening. I, and, then, and now I will do a roll call. Uh, is the vice chair Harley here? President. Okay. Uh, we have a third district councilwoman, Oliver. Present. Okay. Do we have the uh, eighth district council member, Field? Present. We have at large council members, uh, Spadola. Here. At large council member, Walsh. Here. And also, do we have President Congo? Here. Now at this time, I would like to recognize um, the other council persons in attendance by doing a roll call. Do we have first district council member Gray? Present. Second district council member Darby? Present. Fifth district council member Fields? Uh, sixth district council member McCoy? Here. And at large council member Cabrera. Present. And at large council member Dixon. Present. <clears throat> All right. Uh, and I will also like to recognize the uh, Robert Greco from OMB and also Daniel Owens, who's also joined him uh, from Office of Management and Budget. We have an LNI Commissioner Jeff Starkey, LNI Deputy Commissioner Boykin. We have Ms. Marcelle Bassnight from City Council staff, and we have uh, other panelists, as well as members of the public. Mayor Pazicki presented a proposed budget to Council on March 18th, which shared his vision for the intended plan use of the proposed budgetary funds. Now it is Council's fiduciary responsibility to review the budget, have budget hearings with the various departments to get a complete plan on intended use of the funds. By charter, council must adopt a balanced budget. It should be the duty of council to adopt such at least 30 days before the end of the fiscal year. Council has shared its priorities with the mayor, which are inclusive for public safety, specifically youth gun violence, neighborhood stabilization, improving the education system in Wilmington, and also parks and um, youth programming. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the world immensely. Nonetheless, the city is in anticipation, or the city anticipates receiving approximately $55 million from the American Rescue Fund, which we look forward to collaborating with the administration on how these funds can be yet best used for the city's residents. I just want to be clear, the American Rescue Plan funds are not factored as part of this budget because the permissible use of the funds is generally unknown at this time. Before I turn over to Mr. Owens for a budget overview summary of LNI, I would like to inform everyone that public comments will be at the end of each department's budget hearing, and we look forward to much participation from members of the public. If there's any follow-up information that we do not cover during the hearings, please uh, email or visit the budget website, and uh, Ms. Bat Ms. Bass Knight from City Council will track and follow up on requests and additional questions. And I ask that if my colleagues have any questions, as usual, please use the raise hand feature. And at this time, Mr. Owens, I will turn it over to you for the financial overview of LNI's proposed fiscal year 2022 budget. And then it will be followed by an overview from LNI Commissioner Starkey, and then a question and answer from council. The floor is yours, Mr. Owens. Great. <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and um, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Johnson, 
President Congo and other honorable members of city council. Um, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to present the licenses and inspections department's 2020-22 proposed budget request on behalf of the Office of Management and Budget. The LNI department, go to the next side, please. The LNI department is requesting a total budget of 5.66 million in FY 2022. The total requests represents an increase of $191,000 or 3.5%. Um, and funding for the department is derived solely from the general fund. Personal services increased $106,000 or 2.5%. Uh, this was mainly due to an increase in regular salaries, which are up nearly $93,000 or 3.6%. The contractual agreement between the city and the Ask Me Local 1102, of which nearly 80% of LNI's employees belong, calls for a 2% cost of living adjustment for all 1102 members. This COLA, coupled with mandatory step increases, accounts for a majority of the increase in regular salaries. Additionally, one administrative clerk one position was upgraded to a permits coordinator position at a total cost of about $4,200. Also, a business compliance officer position was upgraded from an 1102 bargaining unit grade M to an 1102 bargaining unit grade O position at a total cost of $800. You can go to the next slide, please. Pension contributions for the city plans also increased in FY 2022, up $20,000 or 4%. However, this increase was more than offset by decreases in hospitalization, which is down $13,000, and overtime, which is budgeted at $40,000 in FY 2022, which is a $10,000 or 20% decrease from FY 2021. MSE increased a total of $77,000 $1,500 or 10.6%, a 12% or 55% reduction in furniture, fixtures, and office equipment was more than offset by a $92,000 increase in consultants. These consultant costs will be used to supplement the departmental plan review process. Property maintenance and demolition, which combined total $500,000 and make up 62% of the department's MS&E budget remains unchanged from FY 2021. Internal services increased by $7,900. This is almost solely due to a $7,000 increase in motor vehicle costs. The animal control account line, which consists of money transmitted to the state of Delaware for animal control services is budgeted at $263,000, a 2.5% two increase over FY 2021. This concludes my presentation of the 2022 proposed budget request for the LNI department. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at this time, and thank you. I believe Council Member Walsh has a question. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Lord. Chair. Uh, before we get into the weeds on all of this, you mentioned several upgrades that were done during this period. <clears throat> there were two. Uh, the positions that got the upgrades, were they working from home or working from the building? Um, we upgraded two positions through the biennial appeals process. Those have already occurred. Whether or not those employees are in the building or out in the field or working from home, I'll have to defer to Commissioner Starkey for that one. They both work, they're both in the office. They've been in the office this entire time? 
or they came in yes. one or two days a week? Well, the plans coordinator has been in the e office the entire time, uh, with the exception of some leave time she had. Uh, the business compliance office has been here essentially the whole time as well, even though we've had them working in the field and, and rotating between field and office. All right, thank you. Okay, um, we've actually, Commissioner Starkey, you can stay on the hot seat. Uh, I believe uh, now's the time. And be, before we dive into some questions, if you just want to make a brief opening statement about your department. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of my staff that are probably watching or attending. That's Deputy Commissioner Michael Boykin, uh, my assistant, Alicia Laster, uh, who is my assistant, and Jessica Velasquez, who is the Code Enforcement Supervisor. I'd like to thank you, Councilman Johnson, Council President uh, Congo, and members of the City Council for providing us the opportunity to present our 2022 budget. In addition, I want to thank our staff who continue to navigate through this pandemic while still providing daily services to our constituents despite daily operational challenges. I, I want to personally thank our staff for their commitment. Uh, if we can go to the business statement if you want to start the slide show. Okay, all right. Uh, Commissioner Starkey, oh, are, you, are you done your opening statement or? Yeah, we're ready, to, I'm ready to start. Okay, I just wanted to make it, uh, I wasn't sure if you were finished. Um, all right, so I just wanted to dive into the first two questions are, are, are standard across the board. We're asking each department these questions. Uh, first, can you discuss um, the CARES Act 1, which is the uh, CARES Act funding from 2020? Can you dis um, discuss how it impacted the uh, LNI budget? And then you can also talk about how it could potentially impact fiscal year 22 budget as well. Can you proceed to that slide for the answer? Okay. Well, answer number one, the city received approximately 12.4 million, 12.4 million in CARE Act funding from Newcastle County. <clears throat> Largely, the only department's CARES Act eligible for expenses have been payroll expenses, such as COVID-related sick leave, parental leave necessitated by COVID-19, overtime occurred in relation to COVID-19, employees' time substantially dedicated to COVID-19 response, or employees who were redirected to respond to COVID-19, public safety payroll, as cases decrease and vaccination rates increase, the city should expect to see fewer or currents of these payroll expenses. Next slide. CARES Act eligibility SMNE expenses have largely not been expended from the department's budget lines. Instead, a special project fund was set up under the Office of Management Budget, Mercy Management Budget, to record COVID related expenditures, including PPEs, cleaning supplies, sanitation service, and technology expenses to support his transition from work to home. Next slide. <clears throat> budget question number two, in anticipation of American Rescue Funds, discuss any tentative plans to use of the, those funds for filling budget. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Starkey. Yes. <laughs> As a quick follow-up, okay. Um, just uh, thank you for, for providing some of the um, overview for the $12.4 million. Do you have a specific breakdown for how much was actually for L&I for that $12.4 million? No, because we haven't actually spent it. We use our current budget line of as we currently have them right now. Okay. Um, okay. Now, is there any, and I understand um, that there may be some reimbursements. Is there a possibility of having to use some for reimbursement uh, for the next fiscal year? Well, won't know that until we get all the guidelines for what we can use it for. Okay. All right. Um, and this is, again, I'm, I'm talking about CARES Act 1 from, from 2020. Right. I would defer okay. everything to administration for now until, until we get clear direction on where we're going. Okay. All right. So, um, and that really dovetails into question two. So, the American Rescue Funds, um, is there right now, I know it's in flux about um, what you can do and can't do with the money. 
but do you have any ideas or like tentative plans to share with council what you hopefully, um, you know, possibly use it for? No, not at, not at this moment until we know exactly what the guidelines are going to be. Okay. So this may be a, not a great question, but I mean, so you're going to say a, a, a lot of departments have been impacted by COVID, almost all city departments. So public works has not been impacted at all because um, based on your answer to the question one, there were no reimbursements sought through the CARES Act in the county. And the American Rescue Plan, I know the plans are up in the air. So um, has there not been an impact? In, in terms of, uh, you mean in terms of public works in general? Yeah. I mean, we're still operating as normal, to be very honest. The, the, the sick leave, um, PPE, things like that, that was already handled for handled by existing budget lines? Currently, it's being handled through existing lines, although we are attracting that information. Okay. Um, and, it, and maybe OMB can share some more insight. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Owens or Mr. Greco, it just seems a little odd because we're going department by department. Each department has had line items impacted by COVID, and LNI seems to be a little different. Yeah, no, Mr. Chair, I it is, it is true that the the amounts hit against the payroll, his regular payroll, but those were tracked and we were reimbursed from the county for those sick leave related to COVID, those sick leave codes that were in the payroll. So part of the, part of the first 2.4 million we got from the county, we did track COVID related sick time, overtime, those kind of things through payroll and we were reimbursed. You good? Oh, okay. So, so you just don't know. Uh, and can you give me an approximation for L and I specifically? How much of that total? We can pie? get it. I don't. I don't have it with me right now. But we have a breakout of all the payroll amounts for each department. And um, okay. And I and I, I think it may have been requested early in the budget process, maybe during the mayor's administration. Was, yeah. But yeah, it would be good as we look. Um, you know, in the total budget, we can just break it down by department, so we know. Will do. Okay, thank you very much, Director Berko. Okay, uh, Commissioner Starkey, sorry about that. I just wanted to clear up some some questions. I know my colleagues have had those, that question, and also members of the public may. So um, I think that's that's a good answer for now. Um, now this time I would like to turn to question three. Oh, oh, oh sorry, sorry, Councilwoman Oliver. Do you have a question still? Sorry, I can't yeah, see. That's a, no, that's okay, um, um, Mr. Chair. I, I, I didn't. I just wanted some clarity. Did was it uh, was um, L and I impacted by COVID or not? Because you asked that question, and I never heard the answer. Yeah, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Was there an answer to that, or did I miss it? I'm sorry. Uh, we had an answer from OMB. Uh, Commissioner Starkey, would, would you like to elaborate? No, I mean, OMB, the, the, the uh, payroll stuff would go through personnel or, or finance. I mean, through okay. personnel, so. No problem. I thought I heard Chris. Greco Adam. kind of provided that answer. Okay, Mr. Chair, I, I thought I heard you ask that question. And I, I mean, if he answered, I was asking, was it yes or no financial impact? Was it yes or no? I thought I heard. Was it? It, it, it? More or less, I believe, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay that was the answer. Was, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just missed it. I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. And I believe, uh, Director Greco, you have a, you have a follow-up? Yeah. Um, analyst um, Stephanie Mergler, who, who's working on the COVID, is part of the team. She just told me that the uh, amount in l &I payroll related was $52,029. All right, thank you very much, Director Rico. I appreciate the quick work. Um, like I said, we just try to make it simple. Again, you know, we, we, we've been doing this with each department, just it's easier for us to kind of quantify, you know, out of that big pie, what has the impact been, you know, so, we, so it's easier for us to break it out. Um, 
All right, I don't see other hands raised. So uh, now, now I would like to turn to question three, uh, Commissioner Starkey, if you can discuss the vacant positions and also um, the, the duration, the vacancy, and the time frame for filling. Next, next slide. There, there are three current vacant positions within the department. Code enforcement inspector has been vacant since February 11th, 2021. Building Code Enforcement Inspector vacant since uh, August of August the fourth, two thousand twenty, and the Permit Director, which has been vacant since September 9th of two thousand twenty. Okay, so when what is the what is the time frame for, for filling those positions? He, if I if I may, Jeff. Um, uh, commissioner has um, requested uh, to fill those positions and I'm weighing in on it. As you know, that we are in a hiring freeze. So I weigh each position individually and approve it, you know, based on my discussion with the commissioner. I just haven't decided on those yet. Okay, now has, as a follow up, Commissioner Starkey has not having, especially a code enforcement inspector, the building code inspector, has that increased lead times for an inspection being down almost two very important roles? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it always affects operational. I mean, my staff has been great in terms of, you know, accommodating, but uh, it, it, it affects some of the inspections as well as COVID has affected inspections as well, so. I mean, right. they've been pretty good in terms of, you know, dealing with these challenges, but they've been great in terms of trying to accommodate. Okay. And thank you very much, Commissioner. I believe Council Member Gray has a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, one of my questions was going to be, do you need additional staff? I really enjoy working with L&I because I see results, but I think you're only doing half the job it seems like staff does not get back to people. That seems to be the biggest complaint for me too. I have to call three or four times to find out what happened with the inspection. And usually they've done it, but that's another component of the job that I think should be really stressed and included because that's where most of the aggravation comes for me and for the constituents. And my suggestion um, to chief of staff is that maybe the positions that are allocated for constituent services. I know Councilwoman Oliver was I'm not happy with them and I'm not either. Maybe those positions can be moved over to l and I. I think it would be much more helpful and resourceful and fiscally prudent to transfer them to l and I. But I would like a response from um, Commissioner Starkey about the um, inspectors getting back to people. And also I would like to request a committee meeting with L and I with Mr. DePinto there, because for over uh, two months, I've been trying to get information about a specific place and I keep getting one and two sentence re responses. So I really need to know how things work. Thank you. Well, my, my response to staff uh, getting back to them, I mean, the whole purpose of inspectors, we, we technically want them in the field as much as possible. Uh, so, I mean, I'll, I'll talk to them in terms of, you know, responding back to you. Uh, but my objective is to make sure that they're in the field. Uh, one of the things that you could use is a 3-1 system where you can look at whether the issue has been resolved or not. Uh, I don't know if you've tried that as well. Uh, but, you know, it's something that we just need to look at. Okay. May, I right. May I respond, Chair? Yes. Yes, please. Sometimes when I call back, the um, incoming person can look in the computer and there will be notes, but more than likely there aren't notes. If they could just do that, that still means I have to call. There's no outreach from your office, but at least that would keep me from calling two or three times, leaving emails, et cetera, et cetera. And I can name the people, but I'm not going to do that now that are really, really bad. So I just want some method worked out and you don't have to call me. You can call the person who's complaining. I'm just usually calling for them. Thank you. Well, I'll certainly have that conversation with, with you offline so I can kind of go over the process. Um, I mean, the 311 system gives you a, a number where you can check the number, go on the website, look it up, and determine whether it's been resolved or not. But I we can definitely say, have that conversation. 
I hate to say, but my my phone at my home does not work with 311. And I've had that issue brought up by other community members that it seems like the landline phone, either Verizon or Comcast, does not work with the 311 number. I brought it, I brought it up earlier and um, Chief of Staff said she was gonna look into it. Yeah, I believe it's a carrier issue, not um, the landline itself, but a carrier. So yes, I do have that. Thank you very much. I believe Council Member Spadola. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Starkey, good to be with you two evenings in a row. Um, I'm curious, how are your, uh, your inspectors evaluated? Are they rated on the amount of tickets they write or, or do you look into the quality of the work and the problem actually being resolved? Well, there definitely is no quotas in terms of tickets that they write because each one of them have different districts and each district has different circumstances involved. So you can't grade them on basically tickets. It's basically uh, the quality of their work is how they are evaluated. And how do you judge the quality? There are certain criteria depends on the division that they're, that they're in that their supervisor grades them on. Okay. Glad to hear there's no quota, thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, moving on to question number four. Can you discuss the proposed changes to any positions, new positions, deleted, upgraded, downgraded, or any other change? As mentioned earlier, the administrative clerk, as mentioned by Dan Owens, the administrative clerk, which is housed in the permit division, was appealed through the employee's appeals process and was upgraded. Uh, in addition, the business compliance officer position appealed through the employee's appeals process and was upgraded as well. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> now moving on to question five. Can you please discuss the $500,000 budgeted between the property maintenance and demo lines? And can you also talk about uh, whether any of the funds have been recouped? Um, and then and further break out exactly how those funds were used. <clears throat> Let me just start with the criteria for emergency demolition involved a structure that uh, or collapsing when we arrive on a, on a scene or in fear of imminent danger of collapsing. We then are required to take immediate action to stabilize. It. That's what the criteria is for emergency demolition. Uh, property maintenance line is for property maintenance services that we perform on properties. And that can entail boarding of properties due to fires or structural damages, uh, vacant properties requiring boarding, debris removal, and or grass cutting. And all properties that we receive calls from police and fire for assistance. In addition to that, it could be any other things that happen after hours that we have to deal with. Cars running into buildings, uh, unfit conditions as a result of fire departments going in, police raiding houses and they see conditions that are unfavorable and they call us as well. So. It ranges from, from A to Z in terms of what our on-call people have to address. Next slide. Uh, demolition uh, problems. Council member Gray has a question. Go ahead. Oh. Oh, I'm oh. sorry, I need to lower my hand. It's, 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 it's fields. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for um, being here tonight. My question for you, Commissioner uh, Starkey, is approximately how many vacant properties are in the city and what is the approximate uh, budgetary cost for the boarding of a vacant home, for a vacant home? Well, the vacant property list varies, you know, from day to day, it depends on what comes on and <clears throat> what comes on and what comes off. Uh, they're they're ran ranging between, you know, 14, 1500 total vacant properties. Uh, and the boarding cost to board a property, it varies, depends on one door, two doors, three doors, one door, one window, et cetera. So, I, I mean, I don't have a specific cost, but our contract for the vacant property services, and don't quote me or lock me in, but I can get it to you later, it's probably around 120,000 a year uh, for those services. And that ranges from, as I mentioned earlier, from A to Z. They do grass cutting, they do you know, boarding, they do clean outs, they do, debris removal, uh, and it varies. Thank you, that's it. Council member Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner Starkey, when you're doing all this work, do you put liens against the properties? 
I didn't hear you, Councilwoman Walsh. When you're when you do all this work, whether it be something as simple as grass cutting all the way up to boarding the entire property, uh, do you put liens on the properties? Absolutely. Every every <clears throat> property maintenance service that we perform uh, is billed to the owner, uh, and that becomes a lien. Gotcha. $120,000 for um, the amount of vacant properties we have in the city of Wilmington doesn't seem like a heck of a lot of money to me at all. Like out of that, how many do you even touch a year? About, I know you can't give me a, an exact number. Uh, it's probably about 600, five to 600 a year roughly, and it varies depending on the economy and, and, and all the other factors involved with vacant properties, but somewhere we're averaging, I think about five to 600 uh, touches a year. Some of them are repeat, some obviously are, are the ones that we keep going back to, you know, in areas that, you know, or uh, depressed where people are breaking in, you know, where people are using drugs. We, we go to several problems a lot, the same one, so. But sure. it, it varies. I can get you an exact number for last year, just uh, a ballpark number at least. Yeah, if you could, I'd appreciate it. But congratulations to you too. That's uh, that's pretty amazing if you hit that many properties with that little money. Thank you. Well, I, I would like to add, you know, the contract we just put it out to bid again, and, and it'll be awarded July first, and it'll probably come to council as well. Uh, so, I mean, the contract we've had has had it for three, four years, and its prices are. Uh, are really outstanding. I mean, we had numbers up to three hundred thousand dollars on this on this uh, bid proposals, uh, and he kind of stayed just where he was. So we need to be grateful for him for his low prices. Okay. All right. Um, I'm moving to Councilmember Gray. Councilmember Gray. All right, we'll, uh, we'll get back to Council Member Gray. Council Member Spadola. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Starkey, has L&I looked into um, using alternatives to plywood to board up vacant houses? I'm sure everyone that's listening would agree that nothing looks worse uh, in a neighborhood than you know, that, the typical plywood covering up a, um, you know, boarded up a house. Well, I mean, over the years, we've looked at it many different materials. Uh, we looked at the iron grate ones, uh, which was so expensive, we just couldn't sustain that kind of cost. Uh, we even had some, and I can send you some pictures of, we had an organization or a company that provided us with a screen that went over the plywood, it looked like windows. So uh, we did some of those as well, but you know, uh, they got damaged and graffiti uh, as well. One of the things in this contract is we required the contractor to paint the plywood. So. Uh, we're going to make sure we enforce that part of it. Uh, but, you know, we've looked at all kinds of different alternatives. Years ago, we looked at blocking windows and doors up. Fire department had a, a real issue with that because they didn't have access. So uh, some of these areas, you know, we can board it maybe 10 times and it, they pull them right off. Uh, some folks out there are now really clever. They have tools to be able to take the plywood off and still get into the property. So, yeah, we have looked at other materials. Is that an ongoing thing? We're always open to alternatives. Okay, thank you. And as a follow-up, Commissioner Stark, while we're on that subject, uh, is one material looked at uh, clear boarding? Or is that a material that you've looked at? We've looked at clear boarding as well. Uh, the, the only problem with clear boarding is you see all the contents inside. People didn't want to see that kind of stuff visible. Because okay. you know, a lot of vacant properties still have junk and debris in them. And keep in mind, the city doesn't own them. These are privately owned. So uh, a lot of times we board them. Uh, in some cases, private property owners board them. But again, in some of these areas that are depressed, you know, they take the boards off. We have to go back and board it up. Uh, or police or police call us. You know, we have to board them up. Or in the case of a fire, uh, those are boarded. Okay. Now, um, just moving into the second part of this is the amount that you've recouped so far. Uh, right. This slide shows the, the fees that we've, or the revenue that we've collected back as a result of demolition. Uh, but keep in mind, when we demolish properties, 
when it's completely demolished, the property's worth little to nothing at that point. So, um, you know, you see 2018, we got $17,000 back, uh, 1956,000. And as of 2020, we have nothing back as of yet. Uh, but this is an area that we don't really get a lot of money back unless it goes to Sheriff Young and we recover our costs uh, as, as a result of that. Uh, but once it's demolished, the lot's probably worth, you know, if it's worth $1,000, you're doing good, or $2,000. So the zero, do we expect that number to go up um, in 2021 for 2020 or not really um, because there's been no sheriff sales? Well, we, we may see some, we may recover some fees, but we're never going to recover the cost that we put into it, to be very honest. Okay. I mean, the thing that we're doing is, you know, eliminate that hazard from that neighborhood which is probably a valuable asset to that, that community. All right. Um, can move to question number six, Commissioner. Well, there's a, can, it's, <clears throat> oh. are, you, are, you, are you Are you done five or? Yeah, we're done. I, I thought it was another chart, but that's for the <laughs> mm, Okay. Okay. Um, is there, is there a, 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 I think there may be a property maintenance chart that is later on in the slideshow. Okay. Oh, oh go go back one. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there we go. Right. All right. You threw me off. Well, this is the property maintenance uh, revenue that we collected back. Uh, 2018, we did 113, 1948,000 in 2081. Keep in mind, COVID 19 and 20, so those fees are less. And then 2019. Uh, or tickets probably are a little less, uh, particularly due to COVID. So hopefully those 20 of those numbers should go up a little bit, hopefully. Thank you. Question there. Okay, so now moving on to question six. Can you please discuss the approximately 263,000 for animal control? And then compare year over year in terms of uh, Okay, so well, an animal control contract is a state contract that is administrated through our department. Um, um, animals collected, the chart kind of speaks for itself. 19, there were 470, and 2020 is, is 525. Okay, uh, and can you do, do you do you know a approximate breakdown of what types of animals? Uh, is it mostly dogs or cats, or do, do you have uh, animals such as raccoons as well? I know raccoons have been. Uh, an issue that a lot of council members have brought up. I don't, I don't think there's any raccoons. From the information I get from the Delaware uh, contract, Delaware Animal Control contract, those are primarily dogs. Um, and I don't think they break it down, but I can look at it and get back to you on if there's a clear breakdown between dogs and cats. But my recollect, recollect, recollection is that uh, that's primarily the dog counts. Okay. Um, we have a few council members have their hands up. Council member Oliver, I believe you were first. Thank you. I wasn't first, but I appreciate you. Um, I have a couple of questions. I guess one of the questions for animal welfare contract, um, what is the process? You just answered, you said that's through the state. How many calls um, have there been for uh, animal controls? I guess you can... You don't have to give us that tonight if you don't have it, but I like to know how many calls um, because I'm always receiving pictures of possums running through the Northeast area and down by Bennett Street area. And I know it's because of the wildlife, but uh, some of these uh, possums, I think you had contracted a guy over on um, Jessup Street because they were running back there like wildfire fly or and he said he did catch one, but he had rabies and he had to put him down or do something with him. So, uh, I'm surprised you said you didn't know anything about the the, the pos, I mean the raccoons. Um, and so I wanted to know how many animals been picked up would have a wild. Well, we, I know we have a wildlife issue in the third edition with possums, raccoons, and rodents. Um, and one of the questions, I guess, would be why uh, the increase and in what's expected in return for the for 2022. And which areas have been impacted the most by your phone calls or your animal collections? I guess it was really two questions. 
I'll have to follow up with you on, on those two questions. No problem. Um, I mean, I guess I want to, uh, I know it's been, uh, you recall of a lot of calls from the third district or sending them out. I know we had um, some pit bull issues because the lady got mauled down on 10th street and later died from it. Um, I guess we could talk about it later, but that would be some of the questions. Which areas has been impacted the most by the roadings and why the increase and what is the specter of return? So we can follow up later. Thank you. And I just wanted to interject, Commissioner Stark. I believe that's where I got it from. It was raccoons and possums. Correct. So I, know, <laughs> so I didn't want to think I was uh, completely, uh, you know, that's where I got it from. I knew it was other animals involved. So. I wanted to make sure I wasn't going crazy or anything. So yeah, I, had um, take, I had to take a look at the contract to see if th those animals are included in, in this contract. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Commissioner Starkey. I know this is a concern. Uh, that, that, and um, you know, that no, excuse, excuse me, Mr. Chair, as a follow up, I think Mr. Um, Starkey's yes, right. Um, the pop, the raccoons was not included in this. This was uh, another contract. So I wanted to clear that up. You're right. Because you were saying you didn't have a contract for that. And I was saying, I think we need to find somebody because you didn't have a contractor who really dealt with the uh, raccoons. And I think that was the question. Thanks for bringing that up. That was a question I think that needs to be discussed, not now, but we need to find a regular contractor for them raccoons because they are running throughout, not just the third district, they're running throughout the city of Wilmington like they live here. Thank you. All right, thank you What they do. <laughs> Thank you very much, Council Member. Uh, I believe Council Member Gray. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm concerned with um, dogs. It seems, I don't know if you have anything to do, uh, Commissioner Starkey, with the procedures for the dog contract because I find it to be woe lacking. I've had similar constituent concerns with people being bitten and really the situation wasn't really handled well. And the other thing is, I don't know if this was a city, but I was told it was a city. They got rid of a lot of the foxes because people were complaining. And when you get rid of one level of wildlife, it usually lets the other levels increase. And foxes will uh, hunt raccoons and possums. So I know definitely over on our side of town, they wiped out all the foxes. So I think you need to look at the consequences when you listen to people complaining about wildlife, because sometimes trying to rectify one problem just makes the other problems worse. But please let me know what if you have any influence on the procedures for um, this contract. Thank you. Very little, it's just Hal's here. Oh, okay, thank you. But I, I can take, certainly take your comments and interject some of that uh, as we administer the contract. I'll just one sentence. My major compact, my major complaint is that when there's a dog bite, the, I don't know what they call him, the inspector, the, I don't know what they call him, the fellow that comes out to investigate it, he only gave the information about the dog bite to the defendant, the man that owned the dog. The victim never got the information. I had to intercede and get the information for her. She didn't realize she had to write them request it before they would give her the information. That seems a little backward. If you're the victim, you're the one should get the information. So if you want to file charges, you can. And she couldn't without the information. Thank you. And, and I have a follow-up, Commissioner Starkey. What, what's the interplay between um, the city control and then also the county? Because um, is there some interplay where, where the county can come into the city as well? No, I mean, we, we're air, air sign, from my understanding, air sign uh, animal control officers for the city. Uh, and there's nine or 10 stipulations in the contract. Uh, so there's an officer here seven days a week. They're on uh, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and here on weekends from 10 to 6. So we have dedicated animal control officers that oh. control the city. Okay. All right. Uh, Council Member Spadola. Thank you. So I'm, one thing I'm trying to wrap my head around, the animal control part is news to me. Um, is this something for that LNI utilizes when they find animals in the uh, vacant houses? Or are you saying, are we talking about the city has a line for residents to call in animal complaints to? Well, I mean, 
we very seldom interact with them. Police interact with them more than, than in any agency because uh, they're out there dealing with the issues with dogs. I mean, we, we occasionally may call them if we see a dog uh, in a neighborhood wandering or something like that. But police are the main uh, agency that deals with animal control. Gotcha. So it's just a pa- this is just a pass through contract. You don't exactly. have L and I guys are not running around picking up animals. That's correct. Oh, absolutely not. Okay. I, no. <laughs> um, council member Harley, I believe. I think you're yes. Next. Yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, before I piggyback off of council member Oliver's comment, I want to first of all thank um, Commissioner. Starkey and his staff for always responding um, quickly and always resolving the issues when I call his office. So I definitely wanted to give him um, those uh, kudos first. Um, I wanted to, you're welcome. I wanted to piggyback off of what council member Oliver I mentioned about the raccoons and the rodents and the the possums. Um, As you know, we share the east side. The east side is comprised of the third and the fourth district. And so my question to you is one, um, I wonder, do you really get the volume of calls? So say for instance, if there's 10 raccoons calling in the 311 line about raccoons, do you get that information? Because if you're not getting the information, then you may not have a, um, you may not realize that there is a need, you know, to put funding in the budget if you're not getting the calls to you. So that's my first question. Are you getting calls that come in even though at this present time, you, you don't have contracts to address raccoons. Do you get the calls? Do you know about the calls? Yes, we get we get calls on raccoons, possums, rodents. You know, we, we get those calls as well. Okay, um, follow up, Mr. Chair. Yes, please. Thank you. So, um, so I just want it to be noted that if there is not funding included in this budget, upcoming budget, um, if you can consider including funding in budget, because if you're getting the calls, then you are quite aware that um, the issue is definitely, you know, getting out of hand, um, especially with the raccoons and the rodents. It's, it's definitely increasing. That's my point. So I just wanted to pee bank off of what she said. And if y'all meet, um, hopefully, can meet together to discuss it in more detail because there's more to it, but I can um, wait until we meet. All right, thank you. Um, Council Member Dixon. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had a couple uh, questions for the the previous slides, but I'll hold off and I'll send that to you, Commissioner. the uh, for I know that the, the contract is increasing two hundred and sixty two thousand um, dollars. Is there a reason why, particularly that that this the increase um, because they're expecting an increase in the animal collection since it's been going up, or is there another reason why the the cost has gone up? I I think if I if I can, Chairman Johnson. Um, the uh, cost for animal control is driven primarily by a formula-based um, uh, situation. I think it's based on our population and um, everybody's contract is that I'm aware of. Other cities are also, um, you know, they have a little escalator in there, but it's based on a formula that the state uses. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Is there anything else, Councilwoman Dixon? No, that's question. No, not for okay. the question. No, no, thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I thought uh, I wanted to be sure I, I got everything. Um, and Councilmember McCoy. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question um, I think it's 
kind of been answered, but I just wanted to be certain. So it was more about uh, when we at, we talked about animals collected. Did you actually give a um, the listing of which animals are within this contract? No, I did not. But I, I, I would follow up to find out specifically if they break it down by animal, the types of animals. Okay. Have to look right. at their reports that they submit. All right. Um, also, wanted to find out when it comes to animals collected. I do see that there is uh, there has actually been a large difference from um, year to year. What are, what is the what is actually happening to these animals that are being collected? I have no idea. Or I would have to look at their reports. Uh, again, we don't interact with animal control as much as police do. Uh, police okay. have most of the interaction with animal control. Essentially, the animal control contract is in my department, and we pay the bills for it. Uh, and they say, gotcha. it's, it's so, uh, and I believe it's all dogs. Yeah, my assumption would be it's all dogs, from what I gather. Always has been, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, the other question. I'm um, sorry. Follow up, uh, Chair. Yes. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, the other question was: um, I did hear that you state that uh, you know that they actually are on seven days a week, uh, five days eight to eight, two days uh, ten to six. So if they actually are not receiving calls, are they in the city at all, or just only by a phone call or complaint? Oh. Uh, According to the contract, they're on duty. They should be in the city, you know, patrolling the city. Okay. Okay. And I uh, think the uh, the last thing is also, um, when when we have that list, I just wanted to make certain that find out about the vermin, whether or not rodents of whichever size. I know I'm quite certain it's like nothing like mice or whatever, but uh, the vermin, the uh, possum and raccoons and things of that nature, definitely would like to get a little bit more information about um, that. But if it is only dogs, and this, to me, that sounds more so like a dog catcher. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's only been dogs every okay. single day. Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, I see a lot of dogs uh, that are not on leashes, and I would just think there would probably be a larger number than that if, that's, if that was the case, if, they, if they're patrolling that frequently, if they're patrolling like daily. So, that's basically it. And then, Councilwoman Oliver, I believe you had a follow up. Sure. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to uh, bring up something that Councilwoman Harley had mentioned and Councilwoman Gray. That's a good point. Now, when they had issues with foxes over in the first district, it seemed to be taken care of. And we've had issues in the third and the fourth on, throughout the city, well, third mainly in the fourth, um, with possums, raccoons, and rodents. We discussed this last year during the budget. We have over a thousand signatures. And I'm just surprised that in certain communities that wasn't an increase besides dogs added into the budget because this was discussed last year. We had uh, we had plenty of signatures of individuals and I'm going to make up a flyer and give it out so they can call L and I so they can stop calling me in reference to the possums, the raccoons and rodents. So order 311 so we can keep that number. But I'm just surprised that we haven't increased this for the possums, the raccoons, and the rodents in certain districts. But in the first district, when they called and made some complaints, the foxes were taken care of. I'm going to be honest, I, I would love to see a fox in the third district opposed to a possum as tall as myself running around uh, on the east side. So that I just wanted to make that point. And another point, if there is a telephone number that can be sent to maybe the chief of staff, Dan, you, so all council members can get that number to animal control because, I mean, I don't know who to call when they call me about the pit bulls. Uh, um, when Bell's Funeral Home is calling that his pit bulls running down the street, I'm just calling asking for animal control. And it, it needs to, if we have someone that's taking care of, it's getting paid from the city of Wilmington. I think we should all have that number so we can give to our constituents. So I'm just not calling animal control or trying to figure out what's the number or calling the police station and say, can you tell me the animal control number? And they say, what's the address? So if somebody can send the council members that animal control number that is supposed to be controlling the uh, city of Wilmington for seven days a week, I, I wouldn't have never known that because I've never received the number besides calling the police. And they say they're called animal control, but it takes hours. So 
if we can get a number sent to us, maybe we can call them ourselves along with calling the police. That's all. I can I can provide you a number. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Council Member Fields, floor is yours. Uh, Thank you, Council Chair. Um, Commissioner, this is just a contract question. Um, as far as the animal con control uh, contract um, being um, a state contract, is it, a, is it a yearly contract and is it a binding contract that we have to use the state or could we use an outside vendor um, that would be available 24 hours, seven days a week? And um, that's, that's my one question. And I'm re the only reason why I'm asking that question is because um, I'm going to kind of follow with my, my colleagues when they say it's very difficult to um, get in contact with someone, someone at animal control, and then they take a long time. Sometimes they never come, um, or you can call the number. Like as um, the phone call, as a uh, the Zoom call last night, someone said they call, call, call a couple of times for no one to answer. So I'm just trying to find out: is that a binding contract, or have we looked at uh, um, getting other um, animal control contracts? Thank you. Well, I mean, and, and Chief of Staff, you can correct me if I'm wrong. We've had this contract done privately before. We've contracted out, uh, try to put it out to bid for agencies out of state. The mm -hmm. biggest problem is that when you euthanize dogs, that was the biggest issue. Uh, but when it was in private hands, it was probably almost double this, this cost. So yeah. that's why we went to the state where we, we're cost sharing with the county and the state, uh, and yeah. it reduced our cost tremendously. Yeah. Exactly, and most municipalities decided to go under the state the animal control. So, um, yeah, it's all most all cities have it uh, under state contract, as far as I know. Oh, okay, thank you. And as a follow up, um, I know Councilmember Gray does have one question as well. Maybe it's a good idea, um, you know, Commissioner Stark, if you have someone from state animal control or the county that can maybe, um, it might be appropriate to have a public works committee meeting or something to talk about this issue. Cause I, I know it's always, it's come up and it seems like we need to do a lot with this contract or change some things, but um, it seems like, you know, we're kind of at a holding pattern. So if that's something that you could do kind of within the next month or so. That I, can, I think What I can tell you is that they're only gonna collect dogs. That's all the animal control um, deals with is dogs. So it won't be an expansion um, to collect raccoons or um, possum. That will have to be like a separate private contract. I believe Jeff did that about two years ago. That was just a separate private contract. And just a, uh, a point of clarification about the foxes, that that was not the city that, um, that you know, uh, I wanna say um, contained the, the, the outbreak of, of foxes because we don't, we don't handle that and nor does animal control. So somebody must have uh, hired a private firm to actually handle uh, the, the foxes in the um, Brandywine Hills area. That wasn't the city. So, so Chief of Staff Washington, is this possible that we maybe look at the cost? And again, I know we can't do it right here and now, but maybe look at the cost hmm. of what they, uh, going back to a, because uh, I see it's not in the budget, but maybe mm -hmm. what would the cost of a raccoon and possum contract be? It seems like there's uh, districts that have a like, great problem with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, the commissioner, I will have to defer to him on how much it cost the last time. I'm not sure how much that, that contract was. I think it was about two years ago, commissioner. Yeah, I mean, they, they were charged almost like 200 and $300 for, for raccoons, a, a one a, a piece each oh. hour, trapping them. <laughs> Because, I mean, they, they put the traps out and they have to keep coming back until they actually yeah. catch them. Right. All right. Uh, Council Member Greg. Um, well, who got rid of our foxes if it wasn't the city? They totally revamped P.S. DuPont, mm -hmm. and that's where they had a lot of their dens. Mm -hmm. And I heard gossip that people were complaining to the city that they wanted the foxes gone. So I just presumed it was the city. But if it wasn't the city, who got rid of them? That's one. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, but while, while I have your attention about the animal control, let me give you the customer service number. And I, I'll forward this over to Daniel, but it's 255-4646. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. But I also must uh, piggyback on other council members that I've called them and they've just not shown up. And if a dog is running loose, if it takes them an hour, do you think the dog's still gonna be there? I mean, that's ridiculous. We need someone that is in the city that can get to the situation within five or 10 minutes. Then maybe they can tr track the dog. And these are dangerous animals sometimes. And the other concern is that I really want to review the procedures for when there are um, neighbor dogs. They don't do anything from my experience, but come out and speak to the person. And they tell you, you have to have the owner's name, address, and you have to have a picture of the dog doing whatever you're complaining about. I can kind of understand that. So these are the kind of things I want to discuss, but I had planned to invite them to the June intergovernmental committee meeting because it's a, another state, it's a state agency. I think it's more appropriate for that committee and it's been on my plan for the June meeting for months. So thank you. You can come and, to Commissioner Starkey. Uh, thank you, I will. And, 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 uh, and, and that is a great idea, I think, uh, pitched by uh, Council Member Gray. I mean, maybe it could be a joint, uh, I think, intergovernmental slash public works meeting um, and, and a way for us to get a handle on this the issue. Um, now we are, again, we're running a little short on time. So Council Member Oliver, is there final comments on animal control? <laughs> yeah, you no, know, I forgot, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't say that Jeff Starkey, l and is one of my favorite departments, easy to get along with. They always return my calls, I have to be honest. They've always been there for me, the inspectors, his whole staff down there. So I would be remiss to, um, uh, Mr. Boykin and Jeff, the whole staff is always very attentive. I mean, for me, they call back. I have people that I just give them their number and they call me back and say people have called them back. So I just like to thank his department for always being on top of his game. Thank like, you. Especially during this pandemic. So I can't say nothing about Jeff. Uh, he's always there for me. Have a good All one. Right. All right, thank you very much, Commissioner uh, Starkey. And again, I think we have our action plan for animal control um, and kind of uh, working our way through this. Hi, Tom. But, uh, you're taking Hi, Tom. the time to talk us through it. Um, so now turning to question number seven. Uh, Commissioner Starkey, can you, can you discuss the planned use of the $140,000 budget for professional fees? This is a $92,000 increase over last fiscal year. Next slide. Uh, the plans engineer position we had to was deleted last fiscal year. However, we retained a plan review consultant part-time to supplement commercial plan reviews because the volume is still pretty high. The following, the following consultants are also included in this line item. Our structural engineer that we use for demolitions, roofing consultant, our GPS tracking for our cars, and a mechanical consultant that we use occasionally. Now, um, let me just kind of, uh, so in terms of this, we're, 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 in, we're in these funds, um, is it possible that any funds could be supplemented by any federal funds uh, for this plants project, or is it too unknown right now? Not to my knowledge. I mean, we, we bring them in occasionally a couple of days a week just to offset, you know, the amount of plans we have coming in because, you know, obviously the plans are our revenue coming in. I mean, we do about $2 million in, in plan review or building permits a year. So that's a critical phase of our operation. Uh, we want to make sure our developers and our contractors are happy. Uh, so we bring him in to supplement our one plans engineer that we have, who is still relatively new. Okay. okay. There's no questions on that. Question number eight, Commissioner. Oh, Next sorry. Yeah. <laughs> right. Councilmember Walsh. I just want to make one comment to the commissioner about adding that job. Um, he's absolutely right. He received so many complaints from so many people all over the city because the plans were never getting read in a timely manner. So I'm usually not um, very uh, thrilled about putting jobs like this into one's budget, but this is something that does is going to keep the economy moving in Illinois. So congratulations, Commissioner. Good job. 
and thank you. I mean, we have about uh, four new big projects that are on the table right now. So we want to keep those folks happy. And these are all apartment buildings, you know, 192, 93 unit buildings. So uh, our city is still progressing in terms of issuing permits, which is a good thing and surprising under COVID. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Now moving to question number eight. You discussed the planned use of the approximately $68,000 for memberships, uh, registration, and uh, wearing in apparel. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, this line item includes the following. It's for staff training, memberships, and certification for staff, uh, code books and references for staff, online seminars since we don't, we're not doing in-person seminars right now. And, and all the safety equipment for our staff, particularly the inspectors that are around the field. Okay, and, uh, and again, um, I guess it's the same as we discussed earlier this evening that you're, you're gonna try to look at uh, whether uh, either CARES Act or ARP Act funds can be used for some of this apparel or yes. like equipment. Yes. Okay, all right. Um, Moving to question number nine, he discussed the $40,000 budgeted for overtime. Next slide. Uh, this line item is for our on-call personnel who addresses emergency matters and provides support for police and fire after hours. Um, and again, I mentioned it earlier, you know, some of the things that we deal with after hours. Uh, and we do not conduct uh, permit inspections on nights and weekends. We just, we didn't find it being effective when we used to do it years ago. Okay. Um, and we've actually dropped the, the uh, overtime line based on last year's uh, uh, historical numbers. Uh, but it varies based on, you know, the economy and things happening out in the city. Now, um, turning to question number 10, Commissioner, can you discuss the coordinate efforts between LNI and Public Works regarding emergency repairs to sidewalks um, and what the funding is proposed for the capital budget um, this fiscal year? And again, I understand it's just intertwined with Public Works, but um, you know, to whatever degree you can say, um, talk about this from the LNI perspective. Next slide. Uh, essentially what we do is we identify the sidewalk conditions and forward that information to public works to be added to their sidewalk list of repairs and our replacements. Any emergency sidewalk work is performed by public works. Uh, we have no budgetary operational responsibility for sidewalks. And quite frankly, there's no updates on sidewalk responsibility from the General Assembly. But as a follow-up commissioner, as a practical matter, uh, a lot of times, uh, um, the, the city sometimes is, it's, it's, it's a gray area whether the city's responsible, I believe, in terms of like uh, typically lawsuits and legal challenges, right? Correct. Okay, so if a sidewalk is messed up, they most likely will sue the city as well, right? Um, that, that's a law question. <laughs> well, based on your experience with l and have you come to the attention that most people um, even though it is the owner's responsibility that most people try to um, put it on the city? Well, I mean, I've seen a couple of cases where they've sent, you know, had an attorney and sent it to law department. I don't know what the results, uh, as I don't know what the results actually became. Yeah, there haven't been many cases that I'm aware of. So from LNI's perspective, just point blank, it is the homeowner or business owner's responsibility for the sidewalk? No, I wouldn't say that exactly based on the, the lawsuit that happened. I mean, we still need to have the General Assembly change, change the law in, in order for that to be uh, effective. Okay, got it, got it. Okay. So there's questions. Uh, can a council member go to LNI about whether, um, or at least what can be done with the sidewalk? Correct. Well, if, 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 again, we, we identify the condition and we forward to public works who who have some funding to replace sidewalks. Do they have enough funding to do the entire city? Absolutely not. 
Yeah. If that's the case, you're gonna you're talking millions and maybe billions. It's a uh, hundred million. Right. Over a hundred million. Okay. Um, all right, and Councilmember Walsh, question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is the line where the homeowners should call up their legislator and get put on their sidewalk list for replacement. We don't have the money to do it, but the legislators have money and they have lists to get it done. It may take you a couple of years, but you'll get it done eventually. That's correct, Council Member. <laughs> That's how it's usually done. Thank you. And just to clarify, that's more for commercial properties, right? No. Oh. No, residential. no, not at all. All right. Um, going to question 11. Can you provide an update, Commissioner, on the revenues collected for instant tickets over the last three years? Next slide. Uh, total instant tickets collected fiscal year. Uh, 18, 278,000, close to 279, roughly. Uh, 19, 196, 92, and FY20, 82,000. Outstanding debt as a result of those tickets, you know, FY18, 318,000, um, FY19, 282, and FY20, 202. Next slide. Appeals so, granted. And, and uh, just, just before you get to that, Commissioner, how much of that is not? able to, or, or, or do we just write off? Uh, that is just, you know, we're not going to be able to collect it. Do, do you have a breakdown of that? Now, from my standpoint, we, it should be all collectible. It's just a matter of collecting it. Uh, they're all lean, so they're still on the property. So if they sell them, those liens come up and you have to, you know, satisfy those liens. Okay. So. All right, thank you for that clarification. I mean, we build them, I don't collect them. So that would be maybe more of a finance department question. It's a finance. Finance does the collection once we bill it. Okay, gotcha. Okay, uh, now on to appeals. Uh, as you can see, 2018, there were 22 appeals. 19 was 14 and seven in 2020, 17. Okay, now uh, globally, this is a question I, and I apologize if, if you didn't have this on your schedule for beforehand, but um, now with this new LNI, you know, we have the new housing reform system. Do we have even an early estimates of the revenue that will be collected potentially from that? Uh, actually, we don't. We haven't done any projections as of yet. And it's kind of tough to kind of uh, anticipate because it's actually broken down. You know, we're still going to do homeowners one side and we're going to do, you know, rental and, and vacants on the other side. So it's going to be kind of difficult to come up with an estimate. Um, we can't base it off what we currently do because they're going to be a mix. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Um, moving on to question 12, can you discuss the LNI Department's technology request for this fiscal year? Next slide. It's your lucky day. We haven't requested any technology this year. My, my, my. All right, <laughs> gotcha. Uh, now, um, that takes us right to question 13. Um, this is kind of, I, I wish we had placed it earlier, but um, can you discuss, you know, we kind of talked about a minute ago about the new housing program. So can you discuss the number of rental inspections done this past two years? Um, mm -hmm. And we realized, of course, that COVID-19 had a, had, had a part to play. Major impact. Next slide. Uh, as you can see, rental inspection for FY19 was 6, 638 and 2020. FY20 was 2000. Uh, and due to COVID, only emergency inspections have been conducted related to serious health and safety issues. So uh, I don't have a full year for 21 because it's not a full year. So I gave you the two years that we did have, uh, which were actually four years. But there's a drastic impact. We haven't done any since probably March or less than 10, if that. Okay. And, and I know you've probably talked about it in committee hearings, I know, in the past, but what was the um, part 
of the dramatic shift over the past few uh, two fiscal years, what what does the increase do to? Well, is it more, you just have more manpower now, or? Well, I mean, as of March of last year, we stopped doing them because of COVID. So, in order to protect our staff from going into these properties and potentially being exposed, we haven't done any since March of 2020. Uh, and as you can see, we were on a pace to probably hit about 2,500 if we'd have continued. Okay. So we, we our our goal is to resume those hopefully pretty soon. Okay, so that's that's great. Yeah, I mean that's based that's an estimate because 20, 2020, that's the only estimate because you did not do two thousand and sixty eight, but that's how much you would have hit. No, that's actually what we did for two thousand okay. FY twenty. That's a full year. Okay, got it. From July to to, to June. So yeah, I gave okay. you four years because I didn't want to you know break it up. Got it, got it. Okay, so we don't have the numbers because you stopped last year. Correct. Um, it was maybe, it would have been on track with that if COVID hadn't hit. Oh, absolutely. We probably would have suppressed that. Okay. So if there was another column, that's what it would say, say essentially. All right. Correct. I mean, you asked me for the inspections in the last two years. I gave you two full years. Okay. Full years, not partial. All right. Uh, thank you for that clarification. I believe Councilwoman uh, Cabrera. The question. Oh, sorry, uh, Dixon. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to uh, just clarify. Um, I know you had in your priorities for fiscal year 2022 that you'll schedule to complete 2,000 rental inspections. Is that um, is that correct, Commissioner? That was that was last year of uh, budget presentation. Uh, and this okay. year, we, we put in there to resume uh, rental inspections. Okay, so is so there's no number. So is it? Sorry, Chair, can I follow up? Yes, please. Um, thank you. Um, so the what we have in the budget book is not correct regarding the two thousand rental inspections for twenty twenty two. Yeah, in the budget book, yes, but we haven't done any projections because we haven't started. I mean, our goal is to do uh, 2,500, I think it was in there. Okay. All right. Just wanted to clarify. Thank you. And I was on the follow up, Commissioner Starkey, just for everyone. You know, so it, in reality, there could have been a, another column that said FY 2021, and you would have had a breakout oh. and maybe an asterisk <laughs> to oh. say due to COVID, it stopped, but the rate would have been that. And that would make, I think, it a little bit more clear. Correct, correct. Okay. What, I tried, what I tried to do is just give you two full years so that you can see the comparison. Um, where we started in 19, you can see the number 638. And as we ramped up the inspections in, in FY20, uh, we were on a, a good roll where we hit about 2,068. So 21 would have been even further if, you know, if we had a full year, but we don't have a full year. Okay, okay, gotcha. Uh, Councilwoman Oliver, I believe you, you have a question on this. Yes. Um, uh, what issues are being addressed by the 90000 uh, for professional fees with this money, and how many additional inspections will be done? Professional fees is, is a consultant that we brought in to do plan review. It has nothing to do with inspections. It's just a consultant. Okay. We deleted the position last year, but we needed to supplement the plan review. So we hired a, a consultant to come in a couple of days a week to supplement those reviews. Oh, that's good. Um, and um, do you plan on hiring any additional inspection inspectors? Not, not in this budget. What I like to do is fill the positions okay. that we have vacant. Right. Any other follow-up, council council member? Okay. All right. Uh, let's yeah. move to the. Uh, all right. Thank you. Let's move to just the uh, finish job is the the organizational chart of public works. Oh, L and I. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm stuck in the past with you. Heavy <laughs> is public works. Uh, yes, uh, L and I. Uh, is there anything you want to? Commissioner? It is the organization charter. There are 42 employees. 
primarily the majority of employees are in the uh, code enforcement side of it. There are 20 uh, employees. Uh, there are 18 and there are two. There's a vacant property coordinator and then there's a supervisor. Uh, that's the majority of where our staff is, uh, admins, uh, we have admins, we have building inspectors, we have five building inspectors. We don't have a supervisor <clears throat> building inspector side. Uh, there are actually three employees in the permit area. Actually, they actually should. Yeah, there are three positions in, in the permit area. Uh, we have one mechanical inspector and, and three employees in the zoning area. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, now I'd like to turn it to the rest of the council. Uh, if there's any. Uh, well, the, the next slide gives you a description of each position. Okay. Oh, all right. I didn't even have that one. Okay. All right. I appreciate it, Commissioner. Now, um, turn it to Council. Are there any other questions or comments for Commissioner? I believe Council President Congo. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. As Commissioner Starkey, have we been able to um, streamline the licensing process? for our residents. I know there's a lot of concern and complaints about how long it takes uh, individuals to get to, to receive their city of Wilmington license. What's the average turnaround time, if you're able to give that to us? That's a finance question, finance issues license. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, yeah, you're right. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments from council? All right, um, I'd like to now kick it to members of the public. Are there any comments from members of the public? Okay, uh, I believe there is a member of the public. Uh, we have a Christian Willauer. The floor is yours and you have three minutes. Uh, Ms. Willauer, are you? Oh, the floor is yours. I, I'd like to thank the council for um, giving me the chance to talk and um, and speak to the um, the budget hearing process. And I'm here as a volunteer with the Homes Campaign, which is a uh, network of people who are working together to improve housing in the city of Wilmington and across the state. And um, the Homes Campaign has a uh, an agenda for housing that's on the website, the Homes website, which really encourages the city and the city leadership to um, look at ways to strengthen neighborhoods by investing in neighborhoods and supporting and expanding home ownership in neighborhoods. And I just wanted to um, give some feedback from uh, the Homes Campaign on the budget for um, L&I, which is that we really need to be thinking about how we can use L and I um, to deal with the problems in the neighborhoods, and you know, specifically around vacant properties and around um, some of the ways that they impact neighborhoods when they're not uh, maintained and when they're not um, secure. And so, I'd like to just echo what Councilwoman Walsh said, which is is that the um, the budget for maintenance. Um, I think it was a a contract of $120,000 a year, I heard, for vacant properties, um, I don't think is enough to address the level of um, ways that these vacant properties that are under-maintained undermine neighborhoods. And so I would like to encourage council to uh, think about ways to increase that that investment in neighborhoods. And if, rent, if vacant property owners are not maintaining the properties, we need to have the city be able to have the resources to step in and then um, bill, of course, bill the property owner by, and then put it on a lien on their house. Um, but I believe there's a line item there of $150,000 a year for property maintenance, um, which certainly should be considered um, a, a way for the city to make a, a tangible impact in improving the quality of life in neighborhoods. Um, and also, I just wanna contrast that with the amount of money that I believe is, um, collected in vacant property fees, which should be returned to the neighborhoods in, in terms of like city services for maintaining the vacant properties that if they're neglected. And um, it looks like it in the last 10 years that almost $8 million was collected in vacant property fees. And if you add that to what's collected in like instant tickets um, 
of, I think the numbers were $279,000 in 2018, another $200,000 in uh, 2019. Certainly there's being resources that are generated from some of these fines that should be returned to the neighborhoods in terms of like a homeowner repair program, relocation assistance for renters, housing action program, and to stabilize vacant properties. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Willauer. <clears throat> and i uh, now like to see if there's any other comments or from the members of the public. All right. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Cheyenne Miller. The floor is yours. Uh, Ms. Cheyenne. Floor is yours. Okay, I'm sorry. Could you hear me now? I'm having trouble unmuting yes, myself. Yes. yes, we can hear you now. Yeah. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. I'm um, Cheyenne Miller, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Homes Campaign, similar to Christian Willauer, and just would like to um, essentially echo the same thing that she has shared about ensuring that we're investing in our properties um, and investing in our neighborhoods want to definitely make sure that, you know, what we're collecting from our neighborhoods in fees is going back to our neighborhoods to make sure that we're fixing up some of the properties that we see, as well as providing opportunities for people to, you know, fix their homes up if they're homeowners, for people to be able to know that, you know, we're stabilizing neighborhoods by ensuring that renters have the ability to um, essentially be relocated should they be in a house that's unsafe for them. And also would like to have more public meetings about, you know, how are we ensuring that LNI is receiving community support to, um, you know, get follow up and feedback from the community when it comes to inspections and ensuring that um, when the inspectors go out that they're handling things and um, supported by the community to identify problem properties and all that. And so we just want to make sure that, you know, there's a, a way that we're looking at justice um, in housing, as opposed to just looking at ways that we can either pool fees from the community. Let's make sure that we're also investing in stabilizing and protecting our communities. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Ms. Miller, I believe we have next up, uh, uh, really small type, uh, James, James Bradford. Uh, good, good evening. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can, sir. Uh, thank you for the time. I had a quick question. Uh, my name is James Bradford with the second district. I live in the second district. I have a question regarding the fees that are collected on vacant properties. Are those also associated to uh, commercial properties as well? And that's all I have. Okay. And uh, we, we, we appreciate the question, Mr. Bradford. And, uh, uh, per, our, per our budget protocol, our, our chief of staff, Ms. Marshall Bassnight, our, our, our policy director, <laughs> Ms. Marshall Bassnight, will um, take down the questions and we'll follow up with you, okay? All right. Um, any other comments, questions from members of the public? All right. Going once, going twice. Now I'd like to t turn it back to council. Um, for any questions or comments, I believe I do. Uh, Council Member Cabrera had her hand raised before. So sorry, happy not get to you earlier. So the floor is yours, man. No worries, um, no worries, um, Chair. Chairman, I know how hard it is to try to keep a hold of those, all those little hands being raised. Um, yes, uh, Commissioner, I did have a question for you. Um, being that we did introduce the new legislation or their housing reform, and we are actively make going after the unregistered rental properties. In the budget that you presented, it, does it reflect a an estimate, an increase of income? Because I know we estimated there might be 7,000 unregistered rental properties in the city of Wilmington. So does the budget reflect the influx of that possible gain in getting more people to register the 
rental properties. No, it's not reflected in my budget and it probably would be reflected in finance or one of those uh, revenue generating departments. So it's not reflected in our budget as a revenue source. Uh, but, you know, we're continuously, you know, tracking or, you know, going after people who are not registered. So uh, we're working with David Sofran today, uh, putting together a list of potential non-registered properties. But to answer your question, no, there's nothing reflected in our budget that reflects that. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we captured it in the uh, revenue. That would be in our projected revenues, uh, Councilmember Cabrera. Thank you. May I follow up, Mr. Chair? Yes, please. Okay. Not so much a question, but make a comment. Um, picking back off what the Homes um, Campaign folks did share, where um, I too would like to see where some of the revenues that we collect may go into a program where we could provide simple interest loans, not just us, but even get other folks to contribute to it so that the residential properties, the homeowners, could also access monies to fix their property. Many of them do not have that, and especially now during COVID, um, as well as we're gonna hold the landlords accountable to making sure that they keep their properties up. But that's just one way that we can, you know, another, another part of neighborhood stabilization, reinvesting those um, funds into the community. And I know that I will be working diligently with you and the other departments to make sure that we see a way, um, as it is the mayor did commit, um, and maybe chief of staff, you could speak to this on having monies set aside in a fund for anyone that might be displaced because of any actions that we as a city take to keep the homes safe as well as up to par. Was that reflected in any of the budgets, um, chief of staff? Yeah, so um, just a little point of clarification there. We currently have funding set aside in real estate and housing for this very issue um, for, for those, uh, those I want to call them grants almost, but someone needs some facade improvement. I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of probably $500,000 that we have set aside. And those are um, CDBG funds. And of course, they have to meet certain qualifications. But you know, in, in most of those those neighborhoods where we have the blighted homes, they they most most likely qualify. So we do have funding available for that, and we will have funding available for anybody that's displaced. I think we estimated maybe somewhere in the neighborhood. I, I want to say about two hundred thousand dollars, but that too will be CDBG funds. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair Harley. Please. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, so one point that I wanted to make, uh, I want to back into um, my first question. And I thank um, Chief of Staff Washington for bringing up the point about the grants because I wanted to bring that up too. Uh, because a lot of times, you know, there's some great programs that they offer. And for whatever reason, it doesn't get filtered to the community. But I also wanted to mention the fact that um, those, those funds that are collected due to fines, um, that definitely uh, sounds like an opportunity um, or fees rather that are collected. Uh, those fees could possibly uh, be, uh, it could, they could, the LMI could work with real estate and housing because as we know right now, we do have grants, but of course, I would think that there's more more applicants applying for the dollars than what we have funding for. So I think that that's definitely uh, a great idea and an opportunity because anything can be improved. And I think um, when we hear feedback from the community um, with suggestions such as the one that was made, I think that you know is something for us to consider. And the other point that I wanted to make was around um, the community's engagement in terms of um, identifying housing that needs to be um, repaired, et cetera. I know in the fourth district, um, our neighborhood planning council, uh, the presidents um, throughout the fourth district, they actually walked through their neighborhoods and they were the ones that identified the blighted properties we put those addresses together and we did submit them to LNI. So I just wanted to say that there are council members that do work with the community to identify some of the same issues 
that I know that the homes campaign um, are passionate about and they are concerned about. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, council member. Um, any other final uh, comments or questions from members of council? Commissioner Starkey. All right, well, uh, and then we'll kick it to Commissioner Starkey for any uh, brief closing remarks. Uh, I just want to again thank our council members uh, for, for allowing us to present our budget and provide some, some good feedback. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, we look forward to working with you. All right, we appreciate it. I know there's a little bit of homework to follow up about animal control. Uh -huh. We're going to get on the council agenda uh, later this spring. You know, we appreciate you filling those questions. Um, but, uh, you know, we will follow up if you have any questions as we go through the budget. So, I appreciate Commissioner Starkey and also Deputy uh, Commissioner Boykin. And with that, um, I, I believe we are at our break time now. Um, as a housekeeping matter, we do have a little bit of a break until 6.30 um, when we will begin with real estate and housing and director wear. Um, so at this time, I believe, I believe we can, uh, begin our break. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Commissioner. You're welcome.